Hello, welcome to Physics 115 for the spring 2021 semester. I'm Professor McNeil, and I'm one of three professors who are part of the instructional team for this course. You'll meet the other two a little bit later in this lecture. I've been teaching at UNC since 1984, and I also have a research laboratory in which I use optical techniques to study a variety of materials. Right now, we're studying how to turn organic semiconductors into photodetectors, how to use framework structures to decontaminate chemical warfare agents, and the elasticity of the extracellular matrix. And we use optical techniques to study all of these things. In essence, we point lasers at stuff and see what comes out. So for this uh, Physics 115 lecture that you're watching, we're going to do a little bit of review of the course structure, and then we'll review some ideas from Physics 114. So let me share my screen, and we can see some slides, and we'll go through this in that way. Okay, as I said, we have three faculty members who will be part of this instructional team, and you'll meet Professor Ayan Gyaka and Professor Deardorf a little later in this lecture. So today we're going to go over the course structure. Uh, we'll do this relatively quickly because it's very similar to what you had experienced in Physics 114 or even Physics 118 if you took that last semester. And then I'll go over the topics that we're going to cover in this semester uh, and talk a little bit about their biological applications. Then my colleagues will take over and walk you through a review of Newtonian mechanics and forces and also of energy ideas and the uh, work energy theorem, conservation of energy, et cetera. So um, those are ideas that you learned about in Physics 114 and that are very important to use here in this semester as well. Okay, our goals for this course are that you develop a better understanding of matter and its interactions, and specifically the physics concepts that are relevant to biological applications. We also want you to continue to enhance your critical thinking skills, which is very important to uh, the faculty and the departments that you are majoring in, specifically in biology. We also want to enhance your problem solving skills and your ability to use mathematical modeling. These are skills that are increasingly important in the life sciences as they become more quantitative. And so we have designed this course specifically to support the needs of students in the life sciences. We've selected topics that are important in that context and not included topics that are not as important for them. So I want you to pause and think for a moment. Now, this is a classroom response question we would normally ask you to put your answers into grade scope before continuing. But for this question, you'll do that later in the, in the lecture. But for this question, I just want you to think a little bit about it. What is it that you want to get out of your college education? And specifically, what do you want to get out of your, this course? So which of these aspects are going to be most important to you individually? So please think about that for a moment. We'll return to this question a little bit later. So what would happen if we conducted this course purely in a lecture mode? Well, it would look something like this. This is a fresco depicting the University of Bologna, which is the oldest extant university on the planet. It was founded about a thousand years ago. And the mode of instruction in Bologna at its founding was a lecturing. So one person would speak to the students and um, they would all listen. So it's a very ancient mode of instruction. But we find from uh, modern cognitive science and physics education research that it's not a particularly effective mode of instruction. So again, here's a question which under other circumstances we would ask you to put in the grade scope assignment, but for the moment I just want you to think about it and uh, see if you can guess what the answer would be. So suppose you took a class that all the instruction was by lecture, but the lecture was very clear, was very engaging, was very interesting. Uh, how much of what you learned do you think you would retain well enough to be able to explain it to somebody else? Well, it turns out that answer is about 25%, a rather small fraction of the content of the course. Now, we aspire in this class for you to learn much more than 25% of what we present. And so we, we will structure the class in a way that will foster that. 
Another way to think about it is to look at how engaged uh, a typical student is in a lecture. Again, might be one that's very interesting and clear. Uh, and when the lecture begins, students' heart rates are relatively high. They're paying attention, are interested, engaged. And as the lecture goes on, those heart rates slow down. They begin to approach the heart rate that you have when you're sleeping. And so it's not surprising that uh, you retain less and less of the information as the lecture goes on. This, the research that I'm alluding to has concluded that brain developing is, is very much like developing muscles, that it requires exercise and practice and careful feedback. And if you don't engage in that, those activities, your brain doesn't develop, you don't learn. And this is something we know from other contexts in life, not just from learning physics. Uh, I'm a musician, and suppose I want to uh, improve my musical skills to learn more music. Uh, I could sit on my couch and watch videos of people playing the violin, maybe even videos of people talking about playing the violin. But do you think that I would get any better at playing the violin by doing that? Sadly, no. Well, the same is true of physics, that uh, if you simply sit passively and listen to somebody tell you about physics, you don't actually get any better at doing physics. You have to practice, you have to engage in exercise, physics exercise, you have to exercise your brain in order to learn new things. And in this class, we aspire to raise you up along the pyramid of what's called Bloom's taxonomy. This is a way of describing different modes of cognition, of thinking, and the lowest level of cognition is remembering, where you can simply recall facts and concepts. The next level is being able to understand, to explain those concepts to somebody else. An even higher level is if you're able to use that information in those contexts in new situations to apply to new contexts. Uh, as you rise in this level of, of thinking, you begin to draw connections among ideas, to begin to analyze what uh, the concepts. And uh, as you rise even farther, you're able to defend a decision you make about what the right answer is. And you come to the point where you can evaluate those decisions. We aspire to raise your critical thinking skills about physics up to this level of being able to analyze and evaluate. Now, reading about physics and listening to a lecture are good for that lowest level of cognition, that being able to recall facts and concepts, but they're only engaging your brain at that very low level. And in order to engage your brain at these higher levels, we do other things in this class besides lecture. So let's go return to that question I asked earlier about what you want to get out of uh, your college ed education and what you want specifically to get out of this course. Which of these things is more important to you? Well, acquiring information is certainly a very important goal and reading assignments and lectures are good for this. They, they convey information that you can then recall. But learning how to use new information and knowledge in new situations, that level of, of, uh, of higher levels on Bloom's taxonomy, for that you need to interact with other people. You need to talk to other people, you need to explain things, you need to ask questions, you need to, to discuss the ideas, to defend your position. And we've designed the course to have you do that and therefore to develop your ability to think about these ideas in that more advanced way. I'm sure you'll all agree that physics is a challenging subject and one that you can't learn passively. You have to exercise your brain in order to learn new things. The learning is in the doing. And so we've designed this course in a way that fosters that kind of active engagement that gives you the exercise that you need to have in order to learn these ideas. So let me talk about the structure. I'm going to do this relatively quickly because for those of you who took Physics 114, it'll be very familiar. So the course is divided into seven units, each of which has one or more modules. And each module has a lecture, a studio, and a homework assignment. The lectures will be conducted asynchronously. You will watch the videos like you're watching this video uh, on your own time. They'll be posted uh, to the Physics 114-115 uh, YouTube site at least a week before the, uh, the module happens. And the lecture slides are posted on Sakai as well. Now you need to do the reading assignment, which is on Sakai, and that involves both a textbook section and also the uh, instructions for the studio activities. Uh, then you watch the lecture and you will have a grade scope assignment that you will complete 
as you watch the lecture, responding to questions in the lecture, and then also questions that are posed about the studio activities that you're going to do. And you need to do this, uh, all of this, no later than 9 a.m. on the day that that module begins. Uh, so that, in other words, the day in which the corresponding studio for that module takes place. So that's the lecture portion. The studio portion is conducted synchronously. So you will need to go to the Zoom room for your specific studio that you are enrolled in during the time that that studio meets. There's a, each uh, studio has its own Zoom link. The activities, as I said, are posted on Sakai and you will work there on the studio activities in groups of four, we'll put you in breakout rooms and you'll go through the activities in the studio. Each group will submit one set of answers for the whole group and that'll be submitted through Gradescope. So in the studio, we expect that you will have your video and your audio on uh, as much as possible. And if you don't want to uh, show in the background where you live, it's fine to use a virtual background, but you, if, you, if it's at all possible, please have your video on. It makes it much easier to communicate with the other people in your group. And obviously you have to have your audio on or you won't be able to talk to people. Uh, you should, the person who is writing the answers to the uh, studio activities questions should share their screen so everyone can see what's being written. And you may wish to use a, a Google Doc or something so that you can all contribute to the writing of the solutions, so sort of uh, share that activity around you. It's very important that you discuss the ideas among your group, that you uh, talk about the best way to answer a question, explain things to each other, ask each other questions make sure that it makes sense to you that that discussion and sense making is the critical part for learning in studio you should ask questions of each other and try to answer those questions or you can ask questions of the instructors who will be circulating among the breakout rooms uh, so that uh, you can get those questions answered and please stay focused on what you're doing in studio as much as possible do not multitask it doesn't work do not try to divide and conquer by breaking up the studio activities into pieces. So, you know, one student does part A, one student does part B, another student does part C, because these activities are designed to build upon one another. So part B builds on part A, part C builds on part B. Often part C will use data from part A, so you can't complete C until you have the data from part A and so forth. So don't split them up. Make sure that everybody works together on all of the parts because everybody needs to learn everything in all of these studios. The exam questions will mostly be drawn from the studios because that's where most of the learning takes place. Please do not sit back with your camera off and just not communicate with your group and just let them, uh, let the other people do the work. You won't learn anything that way and it's not fair to your fellow students. And certainly do not uh, distract yourself with other activities during the studio. So if you follow these do's and, and don't do the don'ts, uh, then you are likely to be successful in getting out of studio what we intend you to get out of it. So the third part of each module is the homework. This is asynchronous. You complete it on your own time. And it's done through Mastering Physics. Uh, it, you can, if you don't already have a Mastering Physics uh, uh, subscription, and if you took 114 in the last year, you should still have an active subscription, then you'll need to sign up. If you already have a subscription, please don't pay twice. Um, and the homework will be due generally one week after the studio that corresponds to that module. Um, the dates are on the schedule that's in the Sakai site. There will be three midterm exams and a final exam, and the exams will be administered synchronously. So you will have to take the exam during the lecture time slot at 9.05 on the appropriate day, and the days are listed on the schedule. Uh, unless you have an excused absence, and uh, we'll tell you in a minute about how to, to uh, do that. You will download the exam and then you will have 60 minutes to submit your answers via Gradescope. You may use any notes or the textbook or whatever you have locally available, but you may not consult with anyone else during that exam. You may not consult with fellow students. You may not use online what are called homework help sites, which are also known as cheating sites. Uh, use of any of that, uh, consulting with someone else or using one of an online resource is a violation of the honor code. And we will prosecute violations of the honor code. We have done it before, we will do it again. So it's not worth it to, uh, to do that and have to uh, get yourself involved with the honor code. Same uh, procedure will happen for the final exam. Uh, 
except that of course it will be longer, but again, it will be conducted synchronously. So you need to have the textbook. If you took Physics 114, you already have it, whether that's in the form of an ebook or a physical copy. Uh, you'll also need a subscription to Mastering Physics. Again, if you took 114, you should already have that. You'll need your laptop, of course. You'll need some kind of uh, paper to write on uh, when you're uh, preparing the answers to submit to Gradescope for the studio. And you'll certainly need to have access to a scientific calculator. As far as grading goes, uh, you'll get credit for your lecture participation. That's in the form of the answers uh, to questions posed in the lecture that you submit via Gradescope. That's an individual uh, assignment. You'll also get credit for your homework, which again is done individually. That will help you solidify your understanding of the ideas from the previous week. The studio is the heart of this course and it's most of the credit. And as I said, each, uh, uh, each group will submit one set of answers uh, via Gradescope. And then of course, there are the three midterm exams and the final exam. Uh, those will all be free response exams. So you'll be writing out three answers is not multiple choice. Uh, and the final exam will be comprehensive. It will cover everything in the course. So throughout the semester, you're undoubtedly going to need to get help from instructors and we're very happy to provide it. And there are many ways that you can get that help. Uh, all of the people on the instructional staff, the faculty and the graduate teaching assistants will have office hours that are uh, conducted through the Physics Tutorial Center, which is of course virtual this semester. And you can check on that schedule and find out when uh, will instructors be available to answer your questions. Uh, and of course it's done through Zoom. We will also have question and answer sessions uh, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, unless there's an exam, that will take place during the lecture time slot, the 9.05 to 9.55 time slot via Zoom. And at that time, uh, there'll be an instructor available in the Zoom room. You can come in and ask any kind of question you have about uh, the lectures, about studio, about the homework, exams, anything you, you want to ask. The instructor will be there to answer those questions during that time. Uh, there's also a forum on the Sakai site, which you can post questions that you have, whether they're about the course administration or content about you know, the physics, specific physics ideas. Um, and students can answer questions through the forum as well as ask them. So if you know the answer to a question that some other student has posted, uh, by all means, go ahead and post that answer. The instructors will also be monitoring the forum and providing answers as well. If you have any questions about grading, about excused absences or ARS accommodations or anything like that, Professor Deerdorf is the one who, who will be handling all of that. You'll meet him a little bit later in this lecture. And there's instructions on how to submit a form for uh, requesting an excused absence from an exam. If you have any content questions about the physics uh, in this course, please do not email them to the instructors. There are 400 students in this course and we simply cannot handle the flood of email that we would get, often answering the same question over and over again. Instead, use one of these uh, resources, either the office hours through the tutorial center, the Monday, Wednesday, Friday Q&A sessions, or the Sakai forum to get those questions answered because you'll get a much more timely answer if you do it that way rather than flooding our email uh, inboxes with questions. So if you haven't done so already, you need to acquire the textbook. Probably you have it already for Physics 114 and a subscription to Mastering Physics, which again, you may already have. There are some optional assignments in Mastering Physics that will refresh your knowledge of, of how to use Mastering Physics and some of the math that we're going to use and some of the, the physics. So those are optional, they're not graded, but you might wanna brush up on those so that these ideas are fresh in your mind. And then there is the grade scope assignment uh, that you're turning in for this lecture and the latter parts of this lecture will have questions where you, that you will submit the answers via grade scope. So there is a, a, a grade scope assignment associated with this lecture. So if you haven't gotten uh, those going already, please do so immediately. So let's turn to uh, some things a little bit more fun. Let's uh, talk a little bit about what topics we're going to cover in this class. We're going to start by looking at fluids and we'll start with fluids that are at rest and we'll look at hydrostatic pressure, and that's particularly important for blood pressure, measurement of blood pressure in the human body, and also for physiological responses to diving, whether that be fish or scuba divers. Then we'll turn our attention to fluid dynamics, to fluids in motion, 
which will uh, learn about how do airplanes and birds fly, and also about the circulation of blood throughout the human body, the, the circulatory system and blood flow. And we'll also learn about how the experience of moving in a fluid is very different for something very tiny, like the sperm in this picture or a microorganism, than it is for much larger objects like ourselves. And we'll learn that life at low Reynolds number is very different than life at high Reynolds number. And we'll, we'll learn about what that means. Then we'll turn our attention to electricity and magnetism. We'll start with electrostatics, so the uh, fields and forces from charges that are at rest. Uh, and electric potential and the energy associated with that. That's relevant to the folding of DNA molecules. We'll learn about that. And also to the electrical systems in the body, electrocardiography, the measurement of the electrical potential of the heart muscle and how that relates to the beating of the heart. Then we'll turn our attention to charges in motion through electric currents and circuits. And we'll under learn how to analyze circuits. And then we'll apply that knowledge to looking at nerve signals as they propagate through the nervous system, the uh, action potential in the nervous system. Then we'll turn our attention to magnetic fields, to magnetism, and we'll start by looking at magnetostatics and uh, understanding how uh, sea turtles find their way home using the Earth's magnetic field. We'll also learn about magnetic induction and magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, that you're probably familiar with. Then we'll come to my favorite part of the course, which is optics. Since I use optics in my research, I really enjoy teaching about it. And we'll learn about microscopes and how they work and the microscopes that you've been using in your biology labs, we'll learn about those. And also about the human visual system and corrective lenses. For those of you who aspire to be ophthalmologists, uh, this will be the section for you. We'll learn about the interference of waves and how that produces structural color, those beautiful blue uh, colors of certain butterflies are not a result of the blue pigment, but are actually a result of the interference of waves. And the interference of waves is also relevant to x-ray diffraction. We'll learn how Rosalind Franklin uh, decoded the structure of DNA using x-ray diffraction. And finally, we'll talk about fluorescence and color vision, which is again a favorite of mine. I also teach a class about the physics of art, and uh, color vision is very important in that, so we'll enjoy learning about that. And finally, at the end of the semester, we'll turn our attention to nuclear physics. And this is where those of you who are studying radiologic science will be particularly interested. We'll learn about radioisotopes and how they're used in nuclear medicine. And we'll learn about how to measure doses of radiation and the effects of that, those different doses on the human body. So we'll end up with that, uh, with that subject uh, right at the end of the semester. So that's a very quick blitz through the, uh, uh, the topics that we're going to cover. Obviously, we'll, we'll uh, spend a lot more time and attention on each of those individual topics. But now I'm going to turn this lecture over to my colleagues, and they will walk you through some uh, ideas from Physics 114 about forces and about energy. You'll be submitting answers to classroom response questions via the grade scope assignment. So you should open up that assignment now if you haven't done it already. And uh, they will help refresh your memory of ideas that uh, you learned about and that we'll be using a lot in Physics 114, 115, sorry. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, welcome to Physics 115. My name is Dr. Aka Dania Ayangaka, and I'm one of the instructors for this semester. I want to thank Professor McNeil for presenting an overview of the course structure. My job here this morning, afternoon or evening, or whenever you're watching this video, is to review some of the concepts that we uh, developed in Physics 114 that would be applicable in 115. Uh, before I continue, let me share my screen. Uh, this review will be in two parts. I'll take care of the review of forces and my colleague, Professor Deadoff, will take care of the work in energy. Now, if you recall last semester, they, they, when they introduced the concept of a force or forces, they defined it quite generally as either a push or a pull on an object. That much is correct, but technically a force it's just a measure of the interaction 
between objects. And that interaction can take so many different forms. And for that, we classify forces into two main groups, contact forces and non-contact forces. For contact forces, I'll just write here, contact forces, you will have a typical example is what we call the normal force. We exist, which exists anytime two objects are in contact. And of course, we also have tension, like in a rope, in a car. And then of course, friction, when two uh, surfaces are in contact and moving, right? Friction force, right? Of course, we're talking about contact. So we also have what we call the non-contact forces or sometimes referred to as force fields, All right? These are forces you can experience or exert on an object without any physical contact. Of course, a typical example of this is what we call the gravitational force, right? Gravitational force, there's also the electric, the magnetic, and of course, if you go on a subatomic level, you talk about the strong and the weak forces. These are all examples of force fields or non-contact forces. These are forces that you don't really need any physical contact to experience them. So for the purpose of this review, we we'll focus on two of these uh, uh, forces. In the contact, we'll look at the normal force and the non-contact is the gravitational force. Any object that has mass experiences the gravitational force that, that is within the radius of influence of the Earth. We experience a gravitational force due to Earth, the Earth. And of course, anytime you have uh, objects in contact, there is always the normal force, right? Let's keep this in mind. Now, the studies of forces in general can be uh, are governed by what we call Newton's uh, laws, Newton's laws of motion. And so a quick review here, there are three laws, as I mentioned. The first law talks about the fact that under the conditions of uh, zero net force, an object we move with constant velocity. In other words, if an object is at rest, it will remain at rest. If an object is moving with uniform speed, constant speed, it will remain in that state unless something acts upon it to do otherwise, unless there's an imbalance of forces to make it change that state of mind, that's that state of uh, motion. So for example, I have a block here, right? It's being pulled on both sides, let's call this F1, F2, I'm taking time to indicate these arrows because forces are vectors, are vector quantities. That means they have both magnitude and direction. Now, let's take for instance that F1 and F2 have the same magnitude. Of course, they are in opposite direction. If the magnitude of F1 and F2 is the same, if they have the same magnitude, then this block here will not move. That means even though forces are acting on this, the net force, this is the key here, the net force on this object is zero, which means that it will remain at rest. And the same thing applies if an object is moving with a constant speed and you apply different forces and the net sum of these forces is zero, then that object will continue moving with a constant speed. And therefore we call Newton's first law, the law of inertia. Now the second law deals with the fact that what happens if the net force is not zero? For instance, if uh, F1 is greater than F2, I will ask you, which direction do you think, would this object move? If yes, then which direction will it move, right? If F1 is greater than F2. So the second law deals with the fact that if there is an imbalance of forces on an object, that object will move with an acceleration that is proportional to the, the net force, that imbalance of forces, right? So we say that the F net in this case is proportional to the acceleration of the object. And of course, if you want to make this into an equation, this would be F is equal to MA, the constant of proportionality here being the mass of an object. 
and of course the mass now just represent the sluggishness or how difficult it is to to change the state of motion of an object that is the mass the mass is measured in in, in kilograms and of course acceleration is in meters per second this product here gives us what we call the newton in honor of sir isaac newton now the third law of motion talks about the fact that forces come in pairs so if if i'm using an ipad here i put this ipad on the table the ipad is pressing down on the table the table will push back up on the ipad right so action and reaction are equal. They are, they are always in opposite direction. So these are the three laws that govern our analysis of forces that act on an object. So um, continuing this topic, I want you to take a minute, just pause the video and uh, open your grade scope and answer this question. I'll give you 30 seconds. It says a chain is suspended by a rope as shown. The chain is composed of four identical links and does not move. Now, I like doing this. Anytime I read a physics problem, I try to underline keywords that are important. Here, it tells me that these links are identical and it does not move. This is important to this problem. This and the one that is coming next. Right. The question is, how many vertical forces are exerted on link three, this middle one here? How many forces are acting on this link? All right. Now let's let's go back to the previous page where we reviewed, or the other pages where we reviewed the different types of forces. This link three has mass, which means that there is a gravitational pull on it, right? So that pull will have to be pulled towards the center of the earth. So I'll write FG, okay? This is the gravitational pull, but I will, I, will, I will introduce a convention here and write it this way. Let's just write W. It is the, the weight in this case, which is the E, let me write it this way, E3. And this, this is how we read this. This is the force that the earth is exerting on link three, right? It's pointing downwards. All right. Now, are there any other forces acting on this? You, you will see here that link two and link three are in contact. Anytime you have two objects in contact, there is the normal force, right? So you can see that link two will be pulling down on link three. Link three will be pulling down on link three while link two will be pushing back up on link two, right? But we're concerned just with the forces that are acting on link three. So I'll write this like this. So F2, three, it tells me that, um, that's why the normal force, N2, three, that the normal force that uh, link link two is exerting on three is pointing up because it point pushes it up. Now, any other force? Yes, of course, because there's three and four are in contact. Now, again, let's, let's, let's look at what is happening here. Four, it's pulling down on three and three and three, it's pushing back up on, 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 on four. So for this year, I will just write this, it's N four, three is pointing down. Any other force that you can think of? I don't think so. There's no any other force that we can think of here. So there are actually how many forces acting on link three? Three here, of course, this is what we have on the next page here. We have two forces pointing down and one force pointing up, okay? That's it. Now, for the next one now, I please take a minute and answer this question. It says, rank all the forces exerted on links three and four according to magnitude from largest to smallest. 
All right. Take a minute, think about it, enter your answers in grade school and come back. All right, let's continue. Now for on link three, the forces that are acting on link three were dealt with in the previous page. Now, if I come back to this here, we're told that this object does not move, right? That means the net force acting on this object must be equal to zero. So we know from Newton's second law, F net is equal to mass times acceleration, but this thing is not moving, so it's equal to zero. Now, what is my net force? Up is positive, so N two three minus N four three minus W E three must be equal to zero, right? The net, this is my net force must be equal to zero because I'm multiplying by zero in this case, which means that N three and two three is equal to N four three plus W E three. All right, let's keep this in mind. Now we come back to this one here. That's, that is for link three. How about link four? How many forces are, on, are acting, have been accepted on link four? Link four has mass, right? So that means there will be the weight force. In this case, is uh, on four is pointing down. I'm looking at, I'm, I'm treating link four now. All right. Then of course we said that link four is pushing down on link three. That means link three will be pushing up on link four. So we'll also have uh, an N three four is pointing up. If I do the same thing I just did on the previous page, I will have that um, I will have N three four minus E four is equal to zero or N three four is equal to W E four, right? This is what I have, I have this now. Now I want to compare these forces with each other, okay? So clearly if N3 is equal to the sum of these two here, that means N23 is greater than either this or this, all right? N3 is greater than that. So of course you come back here, it's between C and D. We have established one. Now, what else do we have to do here? Of course, we're told that N3, four is equal to uh, E4, all right? We also have that. And, and then how do we link this to the next one? And that is where this contact here becomes, we apply Newton's state law. By Newton's state law, action and reaction are equal in the opposite direction, right? But we're dealing with magnitudes here. So if I come back here and I look at this N3, four, N3, four, would be equal to N43. They're equal because they are number forces between two contacts, uh, two forces is in contact. All right. So if you do that now, you say that, okay, um, let me just show you the solution, then I'll explain. All right. So these are the two equations that we have here, right? This is the first one, the one I did initially, and this is the second one. Now we want to combine, co compare these forces. We established that this is equal to this. And now we're saying that this bit here, that the same, that contact forces, they're just opposite in direction. In terms of magnitude, they're the same, okay? All right, so I now have that N23 is greater, but then I know that N43 is must be equal to N34 is equal to WE4. Right, but then we have something outstanding here. How do we then relate E3 to the rest of this equation? And that is why then I underlined somewhere here. They say they're identical, right? They have the same mass. And if objects have the same mass, the gravitational pull on them would be the same, which means that um, if I write this, this must be equal to WE3. And of course, that is our answer in this case. So again, anytime you have a problem, read the problem, underline the keywords, and then think of what concepts will help you answer that. In this case, by looking at the forces, 
using Newton's law, the second law and the third law, we're able to combine this equation here to solve the problem. All right, that concludes my contribution to this class. Thank you, I will see you next week. Hello, I'm Dr. Dergorf, one of the instructors for Physics 115 and also the course coordinator and the instructor for Studio Section 501. So I'll be seeing some of you in that studio section. And I would like to share with you um, a continuation of the review of Physics 114 topics as we talk about energy. Now, energy is one of the most important fundamental concepts of physics. In fact, some people consider physics to be the study of different forms of energy. And so let me share my screen here with you. So you may remember from Physics 114 that uh, our definition of work is a type of energy. Uh, work is force through a displacement and calculated by F dot D. It's a vector dot product. So we calculate that by multiplying the magnitude of the force times the displacement times the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. And so it's possible that work can be positive or negative or zero. And when there is work done on a system, it changes the energy of that system. So we have this uh, work um, energy theorem. And if there is external work done on a system, then the energy of that system can increase or if that work is negative, then it can decrease the energy of the system. If the if work is done on a, a system, then uh, the kinetic energy can be increased. Uh, there can also be a change in potential energy within that system. And this requires more than one object in that system. So if you have uh, two objects like a, a ball and the earth, and the ball gets farther away from the center of the Earth, then it can increase the gravitational potential energy of, of that ball relative to the Earth. Um, but the ball alone does not have gravitational potential energy. It needs to be um, associated with another object like the Earth or the Moon or some other um, massive object. Uh, it's also possible for there to be uh, some sort of elastic potential energy or spring potential energy so that uh, if the spring is compressed or stretched, then it can have energy that can then result in a change in kinetic energy for that system. And so the total mechanical energy of a system is often that kinetic plus potential energy. And if there are external forces that do work on this system, again, it would uh, change the energy of the system. But if there are no external forces in the system, then the mechanical energy would not change. It could switch between kinetic and potential energy, but the total energy of the system would remain constant. So let's see if we can uh, apply this idea of work on a particle. Um, here we have a force exerted on a particle and a displacement D that may or may not be in the same direction as that force. And I'd like for you to think about um, ranking the amount of work done on the particle from the most negative to the most positive and give that a thought um, and then submit your answer um, on Gradescope, uh, pause the video and I'll give you a minute to think about that. All right, hopefully you've thought that the D was the correct answer. So in uh, case four, the force and displacement are in opposite directions. So that's gonna result in a negative work done on the particle. And in case one, the work is going to be most positive because the force and displacement are in the same direction. Whereas uh, case two, they're mostly in opposing directions, but not as negative as case four. Uh, case three is going to result in a positive work. Uh, the magnitude would be found from F times D and the cosine of this angle between them, which is not specified, but it could be found from the projection of D on F or F on D, if you want to think about it that way. But it's definitely going to be a value that's smaller than case one. 
and hopefully you recognize that case five uh, has no work done on the particles since F and D are at right angles to each other. So no work is done when that displacement is to the left. On this question, um, we're thinking about two different systems. System one consists of just the ball and system two consists of the ball and the earth. And we have a ball that is swinging back and forth uh, when it's connected to a, a string, um, so a, a pendulum. And the question here is which of the following are the same for both system one and two? So I'll give you a minute to think about that, pause the video and give your answer on grade scope. All right, so hopefully you realize that uh, C is the correct answer because it's only the change in kinetic energy, delta K, that is the same for these two systems. So in uh, system one, the earth is external to the ball. Um, the earth is not part of the system, uh, where it is part of the system in uh, system two. So in this case, the potential energies are different as uh, described here. So again, the same kind of system uh, analysis, um, but which of these has the earth external to the ball? I actually just answered this one, so this should be pretty easy for you. All right, so hopefully you recognize that system one is uh, the one where earth is external to the system, where it is explicitly included in system two. Now, regardless of whether um, you analyze this uh, scenario um, according to system one or system two, you should still be able to get some meaningful information out of this analysis. And the simplest is maybe uh, looking at uh, the change in kinetic energy, which we already said is going to be the same for each of them. And in this case, um, it's going to be negative because in going from time T2, where the ball is at the bottom to T3, where the ball is at a higher level, uh, the ball is going to slow down. So it's going to uh, be moving faster at the bottom, slower at the top. So the change in kinetic energy is going to be negative. Now the work done by uh, the earth in system one is going to be negative because the gravitational force is down and the ball is moving up in the opposite direction of that gravitational force. So that's gonna be a negative work, just as we looked at in the previous question. Whereas for system two, the external force of the earth doesn't exist. The earth is part of the system, so there is no external work done. So that's why it's zero. Now for system one, the change in energy is gonna be negative because the external work is negative and the kinetic energy is negative. But for system two, there's going to be no change in energy because the ball and earth are part of the same system. So there will be a, a change between kinetic and potential energy within the system, but the change in energy of the system will be zero. So as I just said, uh, the potential energy, gravitational potential energy will increase as the ball moves to a higher elevation moving farther away from the earth. Whereas there will be no change in potential energy for system one because the earth is not part of that system, it's external to it. So it's possible to analyze uh, this uh, scenario from either of these systems. Um, I think many people, myself included, would prefer to analyze this uh, according to system two, where the ball and earth are part of the system. Um, rather than system one, where you're thinking about the work done by external forces. But it's possible to get at the, the same conclusion to an answer about, say, how fast that ball is moving um, at a different point um, along the path uh, with either a system one or a system two perspective. All right, that's all we have for you today. So thank you very much for your attention and look forward to talking with you more in the future.